You'd think after being on Zoom this much, I would have mastered all these techniques. So what I wanted to talk about today um, is kind of related to our theme of AI-assisted coding, because AI has greatly assisted me in doing it. Um, but it's also kind of a project that we've been working on. And there's actually some GW students who have contributed. There's some faculty at Mason and other places that have kind of been in discussions with me about it. Um, so the idea last spring was to look at how LLMs can be used if you are doing recommender systems. So one of the challenges in building a recommender system is that you can't make good recommendations until you have more information about the users. So if you think back to like the first time you opened up an Amazon account, it didn't know what to try to sell you. Um, until you started buying things and clicking on things and it tracked all of that. And then it got really good at telling you what you want. And now it knows what you want before you know what you want. <laughs> and so our question was, could we use LLMs to help things speed up in that process? So it's kind of a quicker start challenge is one of our goals in doing it. And we wanted just to see how they do. So we had to build one to see how it works, to see if it's worth the time to invest in doing more. Um, so we've been working on the code that actually does the recommendation pieces. Um, I'll show you the Jupyter Notebooks and then we have it, um, but I'll kind of start at the end so you can see where it's going and um, how we ended up there. So we kind of got sidetracked over parts of the summer with issues and trying to create too fancy of a website. So we had a Django website and we build a React front page for it. And it just takes hours and hours to figure out how React. And then every time you do something, the React goes down and then you have to restart all your servers. And so I wasted too much time. So last weekend, so last Friday we met, and we said, let's just build a basic website that will then be used to test out what we're doing um, and see if what we should do is keep going and then determine with the bigger idea of, do we want to get a grant to try to systematically test do LLMs work as good recommender systems? So this is our current little website. Um, so you can create a profile and within that profile, you can say whether or not you want an email with it. We have some other things, but the profile is the main part that we use you could put your whole CV in. Um, sometimes it crashes if you put too much in. So I do have to set a limit to how much people can put in. I just haven't figured out where that limit is yet. And then the idea is that each day you'll get new recommendations based off of your profile and they'll come from archive. So these are preprint recommendations. Um, if you're waiting for journal articles, then you can just keep waiting. Um, you're on the slow train at that point anyway. So pretty much this is all about getting useful information as quickly as possible. Of course, as noted, these are preprints. These are not peer reviewed. Um, so it brings in five from there and it brings in five from the social sciences um, through the open science framework, which is run by the Center for Open Science. And it manages or hosts preprint servers for psychology, sociology, education. Um, they host a couple for the STEM fields, but mostly everyone in STEM uses archive and STEM doesn't, archive doesn't support anything outside of STEM. Um, and then the concept is we want to add this area called adjacent disciplines. And the concept here is that there's things to be learned from fields that are not your own. So if we put John's profile in, it's gonna say he's engineer and it's gonna give him engineering related recommendations. But John should also probably read a few things out of psychology, sociology, other places. Um, and so we call those adjacent disciplines. And the concept is you can set how far adjacent you want to go. So he may not want to go all the way to philosophy, or he might, but let's say philosophy's 10 steps away. He can set it 
I only want things up as far as five steps away. So it'll be closer to engineering and not into art history or something. And it would filter out those and then try to give him recommendations of things closer to. Um, and I'll show code that actually, we have this up and running, it's just not here. Um, but then the idea is in your profile, you'll be able to set how far away you can get those recommendations into that last field. With the idea this will make your life easier and just give you 10, 15 things to read each day rather than having to sort through. I think last time I looked, um, Archive gets like 800 to 1,000 new things a day. Um, the other preprint servers are much smaller, but you're still looking at 30 to 40 new things being posted a day. Um, so keeping up on the pace of publications um, is a daunting task that this might help with. So that's what we're trying to get to. This is where we started then, is with this Jupyter notebook. Um, so at the top, we put like a little graphic showing kind of our ideas. So this is just a Google sheet. And then if we make edits in the, or a Google slide, if we make edits in the Google slide, it edits and shows up here. Um, so it's just an iframe into your notebook. Um, I'm using CoLab for this because it uses tensors or TensorFlows and transformers, and it uses Google AI. But especially with the things where I use the transformers, having access to their GPUs makes everything go a lot faster. Now I'm running the code for the website on a shared CPU-based server that I only pay $12 a month for. I have to run it much slower there. So what takes like 10 seconds to run here takes like a minute to run there because I have to turn down the batch size so small. But since I'm just playing with it, I looked into it. If you, Like I'm running on a general shared CPU server. If I want to move to a high performance CPU, it's $45 a month. If you want to have GPU, then you're looking at $100 a month to have that as your chips for your server. So I just run it real slow and I just set up a cron to run it in the middle of the night when no one cares anyway, if it takes 20 minutes to run through eventually. Right now, since there are almost no users, just two personalities of myself. Um, so with two users, it takes like two and a half minutes to run when I ran it this morning to go through and make recommendations for those two users. Um, one user has my bio and one user actually has Deo's bio off his website because I want to make sure it gives different recommendations. So he's gets a different set of recommendations, but somewhat similar to mine. So that's why I have two personalities. Um, so I load some packages. So as I said, I'm going to use Google Generative AI. Oh, so I can point out top. This is the BARD version. We also have a duplicate version for ChatGPT. But ChatGPT is charging me to use it, and BARD is free right now. So I moved to BARD, and I'm just running it for free for their LLM service. Um, yeah. We use archives plugin. Then we use a Lang to tech. Um, one of the things with the OSF is they often get a lot of foreign language um, ones get posted there um, into their preprint servers. And I don't speak all the other languages so or read them more importantly. So I want to detect them and then take those out. So I don't end up with a bunch of things in French in my recommendations that I can't read anyway. And the LLM probably won't do anything that great with them. At least the Bard won't. Um, so I installed those packages. Let me increase the font size on this. Make sure everyone can see. Oh, it, so it does require some files that I put in. Um, so my password file, so no one will see my passwords. Um, so these taxonomies and matrices are all related to those other disciplines. So there's actually research on what words different disciplines use in their work. And then they created covariance matrix to say 
how different they are. So like how different are the words engineers use compared to sociologists? And that's how we determine how many steps away different fields are. So the sociology journal might be five steps away while the psychology might be four steps away as determined by these people who did research like in 2017, where they analyzed thousands of articles from different disciplines, built models, and then compared to create a dissimilarity matrix. So how, I guess, similar, dissimilar, just one way to look at the equation. So I put those files in though. So that's so, what's I'm here sorry, on the side. I'm, I'm really that interesting. Um, so it's similar and dissimilar in terms of the terms used? <laughs> fields that use more overlapping terms would be more similar. So like biology and marine biology would probably be fairly close together. Mm -hmm. So they'd have a very low dissimilarity score. Um, I don't know why they went dissimilarity and not just similarity, because <laughs> it makes your brain twist every time. But that's how they did their matrix. Um, yeah, so it's basically just a correlation table as well. And then you just line up where you want to go and you say, how close is this discipline to this discipline in the words that they use in their professional publications? Um, Seems reasonable enough. Like I'm sure there's all, I can, I can definitely think of cases where there's like subfields that cross, like certain methodologies that would cross domains. Yeah. Like, like conjoint surveys, like that approach, people use it in healthcare, people use it in political science. And if I was like, I wouldn't look at conjoint, then I could look at any of those papers. But that's like you can always find that. Yeah, you can always find. Um, that's not a field. That's like a method. <laughs> yeah, and on the other side, I guess I'm just thinking about when like disciplines have similar concepts, but they use different yeah. terms to refer to them. It, yeah, I be, I, so it doesn't get that fine grained. Yeah, like, try find some way. Uh, yeah, basically they used, so the yeah. OECD, the yeah. Organization of Economic, something or other in the EU, they have a matrix of 55 disciplines, I think. So that's how they, mm -hmm. you, they broke into that. Category. <laughs> of course, archives don't match those. Archive uses different and the OSF uses their own. So that's why we have to have the archive taxonomy, which is, archives what they say are disciplines yeah. mm -hmm. and then i had to map those together to say like this discipline the osf is equal to this discipline and archive which is equal to this discipline in the oecd matrix yeah. because i didn't want to go and create my own matrix i wanted to use theirs because yeah. they did all the nlp and machine learning work to create this really cool covariance matrix did anyone can have? If you want it, I can send you the link. It was a pretty interesting piece of research. That on yeah, <laughs> it's gonna be like a a matrix that combines all the fields from these three different standards. Like that's it's pretty useful. It is. So I had to put those there. That's why you're seeing those on the sides. But I'm gonna close that down now so I can make this bigger. <laughs> so first, um, if you're gonna use the Palm A. I API. So that's the BARD API. They call it POM. I forget what POM stands for. Um, so you have to import it from their package. And then I have an API key that you can get for free on their website. Then you have to select a model. Um, so what I'm having it do is pull all the different models and then just pick the top model out of that list. Um, sorted kind of by if they are models for generating text. I just copied that from someone else's code and it worked well. Um, but you could go in and look at all their different Palm models and select which specific for your purpose. So what I created um, to start off was an input where people can put in information about themselves. Um, so if I run this cell, it's just a input field and let me see if I have anyone's resume open. So let me do, I'll do, um, I'll just get Deo's. So I'll take his bio. No idea. 
So then I'll go back and I'll input it. And what it did was um, it asked Bard to take his bio so and create a list of four keywords that describe that researcher's interest. Um, so what I did is I took my model into Bard. I gave it my prompt task, which is this what you see here, create a list, blah, blah, blah. Insert his resume there. So that created the prompt. Now I could probably write a better prompt, but that will do for now. And I told it to set the temperature to zero. So I didn't want creativity in it. I just wanted it to look and give me the basic answers. Now, like a chat GPT runs at one on its temperature setting. Um, you can go up to two is my understanding and that's very creative. So I turned the limits all the way down for this particular task because I just wanted it to tell me that. Because what I found when it was higher is it just goes on and on and on and doesn't really just give you what you want. It writes you like a full paragraph, like this researcher does this and they're very da da da. And, it, and I just wanted to be able to get the four keywords that we'll then use that describe Deo. Um, if you want my script, and if you're ever here, if it doesn't work, sometimes Google will restrict CoLab notebooks if they're running too many through their AI system. And then you just have to restart your runtime and then you'll have a different IP address. And then you can go back to Google and it will fix it. So that's all that is. So then I just um, I have to take out those asterisks because I just want a set um, that gives me the keywords. So I take that. And now I have a list with his four keywords that I can use elsewhere. Um, so I'm taking apart what it gave me. So I had to be pretty specific in my prompt to the LLM. Otherwise, I wouldn't know how to pull the keywords that I want out. So that's why I said, give me a bullet list with asterisks. And then it pretty consistently always does it now. Um, now, the when I first tried this back in like June, May, June, it really struggled with that task. Like sometimes it would give you four bullets with asterisks. Sometimes it would be four dashes. Sometimes it would be four carrots and it would do all kinds of things. So this is where you can use a template to get more consistency out of it. I mean, like, probably, I'm not sure if Bard has the template features that ChatGPT does. This is like such a weird world we're moving into now where like you're, you're, like usually when you write code, you run your code, you get the same output every time. Like it's, it should be very predictable what you're going to get. And this is a kid for like, I'm programming with an AI. I'm like, I hope I get that yeah. text, but sometimes it might jabber on and you're like, shut up, just give me the poem. Yeah. Yeah. But you can, you can sort of program your prompt. So I'll, we'll talk about, yeah, but, but you can say like, use the following template and say, you know, bullet, you know, asterisk item one, bullet item two. And, it will do it. Yeah, it will stick to that if you tell it to use the template, which is there's, useful. There's even a prompt website, like that website gives you the template for prompts. So, like, just insert these prompts to chat GPT and it, it will give you the desired response. Yeah. You can force, you can try to coerce it. Post to that be, to Slack for yeah, us. To, to be a little more dependable and like get the same thing yeah. I want every time. But, and again, Bard's yeah, catching up with ChatGPT. Yeah. So I'm not sure if they do, if they have Markdown in Bard. I could test it though. I mean, I don't know why they wouldn't. They're good computer science engineer people. Um, I don't know if it's a feature. I, I think it might just be like- when you It might have learned it, it itself. It's already kind of learned that, okay, this is probably what you have. Oh, that's good. I don't know if it's like an added thing that the engineer yeah. supported explicitly. But... That'd be a good question for them, though. And then if it did learn it, how? how? how <laughs> and they have no idea. That's the answer. A lot of parameters. OK, so then for that matching, um, on the website version, I have I run a transformers to take the profile and give me what discipline. Um, but here, I just ask the person to tell me what discipline they're in, so it's nothing too fancy. So it's just, what discipline are you in? It's um, Deo, so I'll just say 14 environmental. I can show the code if anyone wants to see um, on the website how we, but basically I just do 
the profile and then I do a cosine similarity against the list of disciplines and it says which discipline is most similar to the profile and it picks really well. Um, but this is an older notebook. So yeah, so I guess for our process, I should say, this is like our very dirty, unclean node um, functions code, just see if we can make it work. We then have another notebook that we use to clean that up. So now we put everything into functions and started to clean up our code one phase more. And then I can actually show you the current, um, so this is the current online live version of the site. And what you're basically seeing is um, this file right here is what's running on the website. Um, so as you can see, we definitely clean things up as we moved along and make it much nicer. Um, if I go up to here, this is the selected discipline. So what I was just talking about. Um, so this is actually where we're using a sentence transformer model. We're using um, Distilbert, which is the smallest model uh, because again, I'm running on a CPU um, and I do an embedding. So here it takes the BERT model to encode, to make an embedding of the biography, which is the person's description. It converts it to tensors. As I said, I have to run small batches. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm running batches of eight, which are just slow. Um, the default is 32, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the default, if you don't put anything in, it's at 32. So I'm running at a fourth of the default speed. Um, and I have to tell it that I'm using a CPU. Otherwise, it tries to think it's using a GPU and tries to go faster than my computing will allow. <laughs> so, so like, it was like it was such an academic situation where we're like, we can't pay for the really expensive stuff. So I'm gonna force it to be as inefficient and possible. <laughs> yeah. That's why we have GPUs, but like ah it's too much money. We'll just do this really yeah. thing. So well that's why we'll eventually <laughs> ask for grant money so we can afford yes. to run everything fast and then we can have it. I mean the idea is once we have it up is we can test it against other recommender systems and just go back in time and do day by day tests to do comparisons like a traditional recommendation system versus an LLM one. What was recommended day by day comparisons and then do cosine similarity again to see how similar are the recommendations that we're getting versus what a traditional trained recommender is that has like months and months of data about the person and what they liked and disliked. When you were developing this, did you look at any of those other kind of AI paper platforms? So like that will take, you put in a core research paper and then it suggests a bunch of related papers. Oh yeah, I use some of those. Do those use a similar approach? With Yeah, they're using a similar using approach. Like yeah, we're just trying to do something a little different. So we're not trying to be a search. Like I don't want people to put in search terms and have things come up. This is more like a service you sign up for in every day in your inbox, or if you go to the site, you get a nice description of here are 10 things we think you might want to read today so that you don't have to go looking for things and do searches. Mm -hmm. And it's always the things that came out the day before. So it's not like going back into archive to say, you didn't read this from 2012 and you might want to read it. It's saying archive got 800 new things yesterday. Here are five that might interest you. Which just blows my mind still that that's an issue, that it's getting 800 new things and that some people like, I guess myself are curious enough to want to know what are the five from yesterday? Cause I don't want to. <laughs> Still reading papers I wrote like four years ago that I'm like still a little behind in the lid. Uh, yeah, oh, I'm not sure if anyone wants this other than myself, but I already have it. So I mean, I mean this is more my idea that I mean, I, there's already a traditional recommender system that does this for archive. Like right. every day, it tells me yeah. what are the best archive for me. 
but it's because I've clicked on a lot of things over the months to train it to tell me. And it uses just a very basic algorithm, nothing too exciting about it. It is like, again, I mean, this is, you could certainly write this up as a paper of like, can we use LLMs for recommendation engines? And they, they work quite differently from traditional recommendation engines. Um, and I also am imagining like there's, there's a lot of different things you could do with them. So by not having to train on your existing previous choices, but like just giving it a persona is a very yeah. different way to search. Like, I mean, you're doing effectively you're searching, even though you're searching for something from yesterday, but you you could imagine um it, it's 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 like a fundamentally different way to do search than everything else that we've seen. Um well, I think part of it philosophically for me is I think search is terrible for science in general mm -hmm. because we're all pickers and choosers of what we want. We have an idea and we go searching for articles right. to support our idea. Yeah. So it's like this confirmation bias on steroids for us because we never read anything that doesn't fall into that list because we're only doing a Google search to say, I want to see this. Yeah. And, and I think what science benefits from is like the continuing trend of what's going on and understanding kind of what's happening in a field, which doesn't come from search, but it used to come from reading journal articles. Once they come once a month, you would pick up the journal, you would look through the list and like the fourth article down might be the one of interest to you. You're like, oh, that sounds kind of cool. And you would read that, but now you never see the list. You just see what you go out the hand pick. And so that's kind of my gripe with search is it limits me so much to just what I know I want and doesn't give me anything that I don't know I want. And they, they're embedded with all the biases of the sector. You know, like you search yeah. for a term on Google Scholar, you get the top hits from nature and science because they've been cited more and more people have downloaded them. And so it gets pushed to the top of the search. It's a yeah. sort of popularity contest of it. And there might be a really great paper by some, you know, person in Eastern Russia you've never heard of. And it's it's up on archive, it never got published and it's like brilliant. And you're like, no one's no one cited it though. So I've never seen it. And how will yeah. it ever come to the forefront? Um, you know, so, so this is what I mean. It's like, it's fundamentally different because you're a you're approaching search from a very different direction. Yeah, and, that's a good way to describe it. Um, I think it's like, it's an interest, like this is kind of a fun experiment, but there is something here on like, you could certainly write a paper on this on this idea of like how to use LLMs for search and the differences you get um, with that, and maybe that why that's good or not for science. Like, there's a lot of things in this. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have to first make sure that it actually well, does bring sure. back useful things. Yeah. So far, I would say yes on my own. Like I look at the list because I keep running the scripts over and over again to see what happens. Um, and I'm finding cool things. I'm like, oh, yeah, I wouldn't have this noticed is, that. And I, that was a pretty cool paper, maybe. But then some days you look and there's nothing of any interest. Um, so, yeah, I would say it should supplement your other search strategies. But you should have a way to know what is current in the fields that you follow. I would, I think that's good for faculty and students to know, like, even if it's not peer reviewed, what are the cutting edge ideas that people have? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a query search then with archive. So archive has an API, it will go, I'm just gonna tell it to bring back 40 from each of my words. Um, so, so for each of those four, the maximum number of results will be 40. Um, I could lower it, move it up. And I'm gonna have it sorted based on relevance, based on their search terms. And I want it to bring back title, link, categories, other information, and put it into a data frame. So I can run that. <laughs> oh, actually I'm running in the wrong notebook, that's why. I've gone over to that notebook. That was the cleaned up version. So here's the <laughs> cleaned up code. 
Oh, so actually, this one's just giving me a list of 13 articles it's recommending. Um, and that's the last one day. So you can set the number of days back it goes. So 13 things from yesterday that I think is a good recommendation for Deo at this point. Um, so again, that's just using, I created a blank list. I told it how many days to go back. Um, I gave it the keywords, which were those four words that the LLM gave us. Oh, actually, I only told it to do 10 here. So in total, we would get at most 40, but it didn't even get that. It got 16. Um, and I had it, this little script here, changes from the archive discipline over to the OEC discipline so that everything is categorized the same. So physical sciences is an OECD category term for these things that came up in the physical sciences in archive. That's where the conversion took place. And it's the first part of my list. Um, so now what I'm gonna do, I'm also gonna do the same thing for the OSF preprints. I'm gonna go out and get them and put them into a pandas data frame. Um, their API works a little differently. You can't do searches. So you just have to bring back everything from yesterday and then filter it yourself. They don't allow you to do like keyword searches through their API. Um, so we'll go out, we'll get data. I'm gonna tell it that I'm not interested in psychiatry medicine and health science, life science, mathematics, and chemistry, because those are ones that get picked up in archive. And so I figured I'll get those from archive instead of from here, but I could change my mind at any point. Um, and then this just cleans up what gets on returned. So it puts everything into a long list, a lot of cleaning up and then moving it over again to the OECD disciplines by matching up against that um, matrix. Let's see what it gives me. So it gave me a list of 40 things. Again, started with something out of the physical sciences. So now I have two lists. I have one of 16 and one of 40 that are articles from yesterday, from archive and from the open science framework. Um, so now I want to get into the actual ranking of those so that I can see which ones would make good recommendations. Um, so I'm gonna use pandas, numpy, transformers to do all of this. Um, so here, since I have GPU access, I'm using a much bigger model. You can set whatever model you want. There's lots of websites that tell you what are the advantages, disadvantages of different transformer models. Um, just depends on how many resources you have available to, that helps. The nice thing about a CoLab notebook is pretty much they'll let you run GPUs for short periods of time and there's no charge or anything. So you can run pretty big things pretty quickly. Um, of course, you can't run a website off of it or anything because it shuts, clears everything out every day. So again, I make a transformer model um, and encode the um, bio, and then I'll use that. So then I'll go through each of the article descriptions um, and I'll create an embedding for each article. So I create a mini model basically for each article and then I compare that article to the mini model for the rest, the resume. And then we can do cosine similarity to say, how close are these? So here's where I use PyTorch to do cosine similarity to get a cosine score for each one. Um, so now I have a cosine score for each one so I can prioritize like how each article is related to the bio of the user. So I can move them up or down to get recommended or not. But I also want to see what fields they come from and do a weighted based on how the dissimilarity. So now I have that option to do the adjacent fields. So I take in that dissimilarity matrix, the covariance matrix, 
And I compare the field of the user to the field of the article, and then I can come up with a calculation. It gives me some that are zeros, so I reset those to 0.1 because zeros throw everything off. Here are some different weightings I've tried giving it, just playing around, um, but I'll just give up a straight multiplication. So you take your cosine score, you multiply it by the dissimilarity score, and you get a weighted score on the other end. And then we sort and put it into a pandas data frame. And right now I'm gonna sort it by the weighted values. So these will be sorted by dissimilarity scores. So in theory, things that are further away are getting a little bump to maybe end up on your recommendation list is the idea in this one, this one of it. We'll give it a little bit to run. Oh, that's the install. I should have run this cell earlier. Since I just restarted my runtime, it has to reinstall PyTorch, which only takes a couple of seconds, but that's what this is. So those are all those scores. And this is what we ended up with. So, so everything that's getting recommended is out of the physical sciences. It's all out of archive, it appears. So I don't have enough of a weighted. So these were the scores on the cosine similarity. Um, I'm not sure what's going on here, but then we have the weighted scores at the far end. Um, so the weighted scores should bring things up, but I guess there is nothing close enough even to get boosted into his top 10 list. Um, and then we just use those scores then to pump it back so now we have 10 recommendations based off of similarities. Now what we wanna do is send it back out to the LLM to get why those things might be recommended. So uh -oh. tell us. Yeah, Sorry. but where is, <laughs> oh, what is this error? Mm -hmm. like... Oh, did I change user profile? Oh, I did. Google, like Google Scholar could so easily add a couple extra buttons. <laughs> I'm like, you know, search for this thing. You could just do a traditional search, which just look for published literature based on, you know, citations and whatever. And then you could just sort of like do archive search. Why not? Like, why why not give us those results? Oh, or a um, broaden my scoping button <laughs> or something like that, where you click that button and it gives us Things on that topic that are slightly outside your domain, or I have a little yeah. box that says, tell us about yourself and we'll we'll give it to you. Like there's so many things where current search engines like Google could just augment and allow the user so much more control over how the search is being done. Now that would totally disrupt their current model of using ad revenue to yeah. Comp up sites that are paying for ads. I don't know. I, but I already is going to with, yeah. and you have it at the top of your Google search is now Google AI tells you the answer. Yeah. So I don't click on the buttons much at all now below. Yeah. I don't even look down. It's like, <laughs> oh, it's right there. It's right there. I don't need, they're like, in many ways, uh, killing their own business model. But um, yeah. yeah, so there we go. Now we pumped it out with <laughs> why it is recommended. So the LLM goes back and says, why is this article recommended? Um, but this is some of the issues with the LLMs. You can see it goes on for a long time. <laughs> They're very verbose. Um, so you have to set it down to, I have to be more clear in the prompt of, give me in 80 words or less, what is the... Yeah. Now also I can actually turn it down because... Um, since it's using Palm Chat, as you remember before, I can set the temperature. I can also set the maximum number of tokens. Yeah. And I can say, don't give me more than this many tokens back. But you can also control it through the prompt and just say, be very precise. Um, but the concept is very cool to me. Now, the thing I wanna try next is to 
actually skip over me doing the recommendations or I'll trim it down to 20 potential. And then I'll ask the LLM to say which of those 20 it wants to recommend. Cause I can't give it like, I can't say here are all 800 things from archive yesterday, recommend 10 because I can't give it that much data. I could maybe give it titles for a couple hundred, but titles don't really give you good recommendations because a lot of the titles are written for purposes other than content. Mm -hmm. It's like the catch your eye, like yeah. they all have chat GPT, something funny in them Jeez, now. Question mark? It's something completely unrelated to trains and you're like, well, that doesn't. Yeah, so you have to have the abstract. So if I can get it down though, like through using transformers on our end down to 10 to 20 and then go to the LLM and say, of these 20, which would you say are the recommended ones? Where I'm struggling with that is that consistency of response. But now that I know about, since yesterday, I know you can have templating, at least in ChatGPT, that might take care of my variation of responses. Because it kept telling me like, oh, it's this one and this one, and then add a bunch of things. And I had no way to pull out what were the tenant was actually recommending. But I have to have a list so then I can sort it and create a like a Python list out of it because then I can work with it. Working with the plain text doesn't help me. Could I go one step further and be like, now for these top 10, download the actual PDF and import the whole text file and tell me a summary of like the paper so I don't even have to read it. <laughs> like, give me a, so if, if it's if it's coming as a digest to my inbox every day and it's like here's your top 10 i could read all 10 and then decide even more from that like this is better than the abstract there's a summary here's the ai's version of the summary uh, i mean the abstract is probably close enough to the same thing if you just put the title in the abstract in the digest but i'm curious if it would give you a better summary of the table by of the paper by asking it to do that i think and, yes but we're not there yet yeah, because yeah. you can't with the API, you can't do that you yet. Can't like you can, it. yeah, you can upload files through the web version if you're using four on chat GPT. But as far as I've seen in the API, they're not letting you do call out, but I guess you could build an agent that does that yeah. in Langchain yeah. and yeah. then yeah. just serve. And then you just have to serve the paper back in in a readable format. Like you'd have to embed the paper and then have it do the paper or something. It's and... just a matter of engineering time. Like how much time do you have to link all these pieces together? Like it's certainly doable, probably sufficient just to put the title of the abstract though and be like, just read that. And then you can decide if you really want to go find the paper and like actually read it. But, um, but no, it'll get better. It's, yeah. And now I have a playground to test all these ideas sure. because mm -hmm. it's all up and running finally at last. The other um, thing though is I, I, I'm fairly sure that archive requires you to submit a box file when you, when you make. Oh yes, yeah, they do. And so, like you're, you're not submitting just any random PDF. You're submitting a text document, a text file. So, I mean, but you don't have access, don't have as, access as the access user to, to the LaTeX. No, you, you only have the PDF. So it's like a matter of whether archive will ever make that accessible or not. But if they ever choose or allow you to just pull in the text file, you can get the LaTeX so quickly. But What's interesting about it too is I've discovered this thing with submitting things to archive. If you try to create a PDF out of LaTeX, like if you're an overleaf and yeah. you try to save it as a PDF, it will reject your PDF. Yeah. Like now, if you're like in Word and you create a PDF, it will accept that PDF. But if you try a LaTeX generated PDF, it'll come back and say, your PDF was generated in LaTeX. We want the LaTeX file. Yeah. I was like, how did they know? Somewhere in the metadata, the PDF, I guess, is a line somewhere that says this was generated from LaTeX. Yeah. And then they kick it right back at you and they're like, no, you have to submit. So that's why I wanted to present. Um, oh, we're almost out of time too. So. Maybe a good time to go back to now and record. Yeah. I got a one call call. I got to make